The Korea Pathfinder Lunar Orbiter has successfully launched on a Falcon 9 rocket on Thursday from Space Launch Complex 40 at Cape Canaveral. Two and a half minutes after launch, the rocket's first stage separated from the upper stage and came down for a vertical landing on the SpaceX drone ship stationed in the Atlantic Ocean. It was the sixth touchdown to date for this veteran booster. The second stage continued carrying the Lunar Pathfinder into the sky, ultimately deploying the spacecraft into a ballistic lunar transfer orbit as planned. It was Korea's first ever deep space mission. The Korea Pathfinder Lunar Orbiter, officially named Denuri, meaning Enjoy the Moon, is developed and managed by the Korea Aerospace Research Institute. The 550kg spacecraft has a cubic shape with two solar panels and a parabolic antenna mounted on a boom. The $180 million mission, launched on a low-energy fuel-efficient ballistic lunar transfer trajectory, is expected to reach the moon in mid-December. After entering a roughly 100-kilometer circular polar lunar orbit, Denuri will study the moon for at least a year with its five main scientific instruments. The spacecraft is equipped with two indigenously built cameras. The lunar terrain imager will image the moon's surface at a higher resolution of 2.5 meters per pixel. A wide-angle polarimetric camera, on the other hand, can determine the type of surface material based on how light reflects and scatters off it. Denuri also has a gamma-ray spectrometer, which will analyze highly energetic gamma rays emitted by the moon. This will help to determine the lunar surface's elemental makeup. The last of Denuri's indigenous instruments is a magnetometer. The moon lost its global magnetic field well over 3 billion years ago, but it does have local areas that are still magnetic. These fields shield parts of the lunar surface from solar wind and micrometeorites, making them appear brighter than their surroundings. By measuring the weak magnetic fields from orbit, Denuri will help researchers understand the extent of protection they offer from harmful space radiation. Shadow Cam, Denuri's final instrument, is a NASA-supplied ultra-sensitive camera that can see inside permanently shadowed areas on the Moon. It will provide critical information about the terrain and water in such areas. Data collected from Denuri will allow researchers to take measurements of the lunar surface and identify potential landing sites for future missions, including NASA's Artemis program. South Korea is also planning to send a lunar lander and a 20 kg rover to the surface of the moon by 2030. Astronomers have been outraged by SpaceX's Starlink satellites since their launch in 2019. While the satellites may not completely ruin the images captured by sensitive astronomical equipment, they have become an annoyance to both professional and amateur astronomers. Recently, SpaceX announced new upgrades to the satellites to keep them from bothering astronomers. The upgrades address the way in which the next-generation Starlink satellites reflect sunlight as they orbit the Earth. According to SpaceX, Starlink satellites are most visible in the first few hours after dusk, which is when a lot of astronomical observations on comets and near-Earth asteroids take place. SpaceX has previously tried installing a sun visor on its satellites. However, the company now claims that these visors that block the sun's rays can also block Starlink laser links. They also cause excessive atmospheric drag, requiring the satellites to burn more fuel to maintain their orbits. As an alternative, SpaceX has developed a mirror film for the satellites. This film will scatter a vast majority of sunlight away from Earth. In addition, SpaceX says it will begin using a darker material between the solar cells of the satellite's solar panels. Even though this intercell backing material raises solar array temperature and thus reduces performance, SpaceX has chosen to implement this design change to make the surfaces less reflective. SpaceX also explains that its second-generation Starlink solar arrays will be pointed away from the sun at specific times of the day. This off-pointing maneuver will result in a 25% reduction in available power for the satellites, but SpaceX has specifically designed the satellites to accommodate this significant power reduction. Finally, new black paint will be applied to every other component of the satellites, such as the antenna and brackets. According to SpaceX, these measures will make Starlink satellites invisible to the naked eye at their standard operational altitude. Furthermore, the company is working to develop and implement technologies and operational techniques to reduce the satellite's brightness even further. A United Launch Alliance Atlas V rocket launched the Sibers Geo-6 missile warning satellite for the U.S. Space Force from Space Launch Complex 41 at Cape Canaveral Space Force Station on August 4. A little more than four minutes into the flight, the rocket's core stage separated, setting up the Centaur upper stage for a series of engine burns. About three hours after liftoff, the 4,850-kg satellite was deployed into a geosynchronous transfer orbit at an altitude of 35,700 kilometers. 
The Space-Based Infrared System, or SIBRS, is an American space surveillance system intended to provide key capabilities in areas of missile warning, missile defense, and battle space characterization, and is considered one of the nation's highest priority space programs. The system consists of satellites and hosted payloads in geosynchronous and highly elliptical orbits, as well as a network of ground-based data processing and control centers capable of determining the trajectory of a missile. The satellite carries infrared sensors to detect heat plumes from rocket exhaust and provide the first warning of a missile launch. Sibers Geo-6 is the sixth and final spacecraft in the Sibers program. The first Sibers satellite was launched into a geosynchronous orbit in 2011. Thursday's launch was the 95th mission of the Atlas V, a workhorse rocket that United Launch Alliance plans to retire in the near future. ULA still has 19 remaining missions under contract for the Atlas V before its transitions to a new vehicle, the Vulcan Centaur. Blue Origin launched six more space tourists on a quick 10-minute flight to suborbital space on Thursday. A new Shepard rocket lifted off on the NS-22 mission on August 4 from Blue Origin's launch site 1 in West Texas. As with three previous crewed flights, the NS-22 carried a crew of six people, who nicknamed themselves Titanium Feather. Please see the link in the description for more information on the passengers. After the engine cutoff, the booster separated from the crew capsule and made a propulsive landing seven and a half minutes after launch. While the capsule, which reached a peak altitude of approximately 107 kilometers, gave the passengers time to unstrap from their seats and float around the pressurized cabin in microgravity. After falling back into the thicker layers of the atmosphere, the capsule deployed a drogue chute, followed by three main parachutes. The capsule then fired retro rockets and landed in West Texas about 10 minutes and 20 seconds after liftoff. Thursday's mission was Blue Origin's sixth crewed suborbital mission and the 22nd overall launch ever since the company's establishment. The mission brought the total number of people transported to the edge of space by Blue Origin to 31. Now, let's discuss some of the major Starship updates from the past week. Starship 24's static fire test has been postponed once again. The prototype was supposed to fire its engines during testing hours scheduled for Monday through Thursday, but SpaceX canceled all those plans, pushing back the static fire test by at least a week. Meanwhile, at the build site, teams continue to replace Raptor engines from Booster 7 following the July 11 anomaly. Despite Elon Musk's statement on July 13 that Booster 7 would return to the launch site within a week for testing, work on the prototype has been continuing over the past three weeks in the wide bay. It's currently unclear how long it will take for Booster 7 to arrive at the launch site and resume testing. Because Booster 7 is still in the middle of repairs and Ship 24's testing has been sluggish, the inaugural orbital test flight of Starship will also be pushed back by several weeks. If SpaceX begins Ship 24 testing as soon as next week and Booster 7 is ready for rollout to the launch site by late August, the orbital launch is likely to take place in late October or early November. However, a more reasonable launch date is December or January of next year. Elon Musk recently stated in a tweet that the first successful orbital Starship launch will probably happen between 1 and 12 months from now. Musk, who said nearly the same thing a year ago, now believes that Starship's first successful orbital launch attempt could take place as early as September. However, his tweet also implies that SpaceX might need a year and multiple attempts to achieve Starship's first successful orbital launch. It's even possible to read his tweet as a notice that Starship's first orbital launch, while more likely to succeed, could take up to a year. Furthermore, the term successful in Musk's tweet is a bit confusing. If success, according to Musk, is getting into orbit on the first try and deploying a few second-generation Starlink satellites, SpaceX's chances aren't bad. But if success is defined as a super-heavy booster catch and Starship surviving its first orbital re-entry, the chances are very slim. You know, with, uh Falcon 9, I think it took us 14 or 15 attempts to successfully land the first booster. Um, I don't think it'll take us that many with uh, Starship because we have that experience, uh, but it's, uh, it's certainly not a sure thing that it'll work the first time. So, what do you think? When will SpaceX be ready for Starship's orbital test flight? And will they succeed on the first try? Let me know in the comments section. For the past two weeks, the attention of SpaceX teams at the launch site has been shifted to setting up the launch site in Stage 0 for the upcoming ground tests and orbital flight. Teams were seen working on the suborbital launch pad B and the engines of Ship 24. It appears that SpaceX is making sure everything is perfectly set up before beginning the static fire tests. The water deluge system of the pad was tested on Thursday, August 4. The high-speed water flow will help protect the vehicle from the extreme acoustic and thermal environment during testing. 
The static fire test of Ship 24 will be the first ever static firing of Raptor version 2 engines at Starbase, and SpaceX certainly does not want an anomaly with Ship 24 like the one that happened to Booster 7 last month. As a result, they are working hard to ensure that everything goes as planned. Ship 24's thermal protection tile installation work is also progressing. Almost all the heat tiles on the ship's windward side have been installed, with only a few remaining. Repairs and upgrades to the orbital launch mount following the Booster 7 anomaly are ongoing. Teams began installing blast protection covers over the sensitive components of the launch mount. The covers will shield electrical wiring and other delicate instruments during a Starship launch and super heavy testing. The rocket catching and stacking arm upgrade work is continuing. Teams continue to install hydraulic actuators that will act as shock absorbers during a rocket catch attempt. A total of 10 such actuators are required to safely catch starships and super heavies from mid-air. You may recall the Raptor engine maintenance platform that was delivered to the launch site a few weeks ago. The platform is designed to ease the process of installing, removing, or repairing the Raptor engines of the super heavy boosters that will be installed on the orbital launch mount. The platform underwent a fit check and a few test lifts last week. The Star Factory work is progressing at the build site. The bridge cranes to be installed inside the factory arrived at the site last week. The roof and wall work of the part of the factory currently under construction is about half complete. When finished, the Star Factory will replace all construction tents at the build site. Part of the booster downcomer was delivered to Starbase on Thursday. The aft dome section of Starship 25 was moved into the high bay for stacking the same day. Raptor engine delivery to Starbase is continuing. The engines delivered were later moved into the wide bay for installing into Booster 7. At Kennedy Space Center, teams began assembling a water tower near the Starship launch pad. With this, we have covered all the major updates from last week. Please share your thoughts on the latest science news and Starship updates in the comments section. Also, do not forget to subscribe to the channel for more weekly updates. And as always, thanks for watching.